and we are talking about um, what are the little bit of, little bits of wisdom that we need for our personal lives um every often we find ourselves at a place at a crossroad where we wonder uh, i wish somebody would tell me what i need to do at this point of time uh, i wish i have a little more wisdom to to choose the right thing to do uh, and we talked about wisdom as uh, um as as doing what is just what is fair and what is right in the sight of god um while knowledge is information acquired wisdom is application of that knowledge into our personal lives in in a just manner in a right manner um in a fair manner in the sight of god and only god can give us this wisdom and that's how we started our week 1 uh, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the lord fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom if you have the fear of god then you live your life fearlessly that was the first little bit of wisdom that we uh, we received from the series and last week we looked at a second um little bit of wisdom uh talking about how we we need to honor people around us um honoring adding value to people brings value back to us if you learn to honor your parents if you learn to honor elders because i think somehow in our culture honor culture is going down um we need to teach our younger generation that we need to honor parents and honoring begins within home and as you begin to honor people it brings back to you a benefit comes back to you it adds value to your life today we're going to look at uh, another area uh, that the wise man consistently talks about it's the life of a learner uh, how important a life of a learner is we're going to talk about that um, i'm sure you would have read proverbs chapter 4 uh, this morning during the worship time um, proverbs chapter 4 verses 1 to 11 is a father's advice to his son to seek wisdom if you divide the book of proverbs into two parts chapter 1 to chapter 9 is about making a case for wisdom and chapter 10 to uh, ch- chapter 31 is is you know bits of wisdom that the wise people gave to us uh, from chapter 1 to 9 he constantly makes an appeal to us to seek wisdom look at verses 1 just verses 1 he says my children listen to your father when he corrects you pay attention and learn good judgment this is most important in fact as you go on reading the next few verses you would, you would see that wisdom gives you life he says it's like a life a fountain of life for you you will be guarded you will be protected wisdom is good for us because it is more it will teach us how to live morally correct in our lives the world knows we know the world needs uh, morality right morality to know what is right and what is wrong and not only wisdom teaches us what is right and what is wrong it in fact uh, is personally good for us it saves us that's why in verse 7 of chapter 4 he makes a challenge to us he gives a challenge to us he says wisdom is supreme get wisdom sell all that your possessions that you got in order to gain some understanding for your life what a what a way to put it isn't it he's saying it doesn't matter how much you achieved in your life it doesn't matter how much you accumulated it, it really if you don't have wisdom it really doesn't matter sell all that you got get some understanding for your life get some wisdom for your life say that wisdom is supreme say that with me wisdom is supreme that's the one thing that you all need we all need in our lives and so that's the whole goal of this series um as i was reading chapter 14 verses 1 to 11 um i saw that the wise man lists out many benefits uh, of of gaining wisdom in our lives wisdom gives us understanding wisdom protects us from falling down wisdom will keep a watch over our lives wisdom in fact brings promotion to us uh, if some of you are looking for promotions at your work you need wisdom and so ask for wisdom and you will get promotions in your in your offices uh, wisdom will exalt you and promote you uh, he says wisdom will bring honor to your life people will begin to respect you because of the wisdom that you carry um, wisdom will bring grace into your life meaning you will understand how to relate with one another um, how to maintain your relationship in a healthy manner uh, wisdom teaches you how to have good relationship and good relationships and healthy relationships it brings grace to you uh, what's more on the last day wisdom will give you crown of glory he says the last day when you meet 
your creator face to face, uh, you will receive a crown of glory because of the wisdom that you possess today. So the, the, he goes on listing a lot of uh, benefits out of wisdom, uh, for wisdom through wisdom um, in chapter 1 to chapter 9. All through this, not only he makes a case for wisdom, saying that the world needs wisdom, it's also important for you to understand how a fool looks like. Verses chapter 1 to chapter 9, he does consistent comparison and does a contrast between a wise person and a foolish person. The world does need wise people. Huh? I was reading an article um, on leadership, um, I think in Reader's Digest, um, 1994 Reader's Digest, an article in, um, in June's edition. Um, and you know Reader's Digest, apart from the articles, carries a lot of jokes and you know, anecdotes. And one of those anecdotes, while I was reading this article, one of those anecdotes I found um, um, you know, somewhere in the, hidden in the pages of, uh, of that Reader's Digest. It talks about two guys who were watching 11 o'clock news that day. And uh, they had this conversation while they were watching the news that looked like a live coverage. And while they were talking to each other, they, they were actually watching on the live, um, well, it, I don't know whether it is live or repeated telecast, something like that. While it was there, they, they were watching a guy who was standing on a 20 floor building, on the top of a 20 floor building, attempting to commit suicide. So there he was, man on the ledge. Um, you know, waiting to jump off and all these TV screens are filled with this guy there and um, the cameras covering and all this. These two guys laid back on their sofas are talking to each other and one of them turned to the other guy and said, I I I'll bet this guy will not jump. I'll bet $20 this, this guy will not jump. The other guy looked at him and smugly smiled and said, um, all right, let's take the bet. And as they kept watching, a few minutes, few minutes later, that guy did jump off the 20th floor building and, and died. And um, the guy who bet the, in the first place was, looked disappointed. He pulled out the $20 bill and he was about to give it to, the, give it to his friend with whom he bet. The friend looked at him and smiled and said, well, I really can't accept that. You know, he said that sheepishly and said, um, actually, I watched the 6 o'clock news. This was the 6 o'clock news. The other guy, without battling his eyelids, looked at him and said, I also watched the 6 o'clock news. I thought this time you won't jump. Uh, some of you will take some time. Reach there, take time. The world needs people with wisdom. A little bit of wisdom, right? The thing is, we, we, we may not be like this guy, but at least we are like that in one sense that we don't really learn from our mistakes. We are not constant consistent learners. That's one of the reasons why we get stuck in one place and never grow to where we aspire to be. And so the wise man constantly gives us this call, hey, develop a life of learning. Because fools don't learn. What they do is just talk. So let me just divide the entire sermon into three parts and then leave you with a little bit of wisdom that you need for today. Um, the, when he talks about fools, he, always, he, he says, foolish, just talk. That's all they do. Their talk revolves around three things. Number one, I know it all. If you don't, know, if you don't have notes, you just have to lift your hands, we'll get you the notes. If you have the notes, you may want to write down. The one thing that fools always say is this, I know. You don't have to tell me. I already know this. They, they, they behave as if they know it all. They talk as if they know it all. That's why their ears are never open to receive any wisdom at all. Proverbs chapter 10 verses 8 says this. The wise are glad to be instructed. But the babbling fools fall on their faces. One of the reasons why we usually fall flat on our faces is because we are talking rather than listening. I like the way the Bible described them, the fools, babbling fools. They constantly talk and talk and talk and, you know, there's nothing good comes out of that. Just simply talk and they behave as if they know it all. Proverbs 28 verses 26. Those who trust in their own insight are foolish. But anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. Those who trust in their own insight, Bible calls them fools. Here, here is the problem. When a person thinks that he knows everything that there is to know, 
he is in the path of self destruction remember that if you are a person who thinks you don't have to tell me anything i already know everything you are in the path of self destruction it's a very simple thing you are in the path of self destruction because of few reasons i'll give you three reasons it's not in your notes you want to write down write it down it blinds you from all truths once you think you know everything you can't see new truth because you're blind now your perception of yourself as the smartest man on the earth keeps you from learning anything at all so there are no truths no new truths in fact it begins to affect you it blinds you and then it stunts your personal growth that's the second problem you don't grow you get you you get you, you get to stay at the same place worst case you'll actually go down instead of growing up why don't we grow personally that's because we keep making the same mistakes again and again since we stopped learning there are no new insights to gain no new truths to be told to us we stay in the same place well we keep making the same mistakes again and again if you are one of those who are constantly failing at the same thing again and again chances are you are not learning the bible calls you a fool could be possible that you are allowing your pride which says i know it all you don't have to tell me anything stop you from growing the most damaging aspect of a i know it all attitude is this that it strains relationships with others i mean who would want to be around a guy who is always behaving as if i know it all you don't have to tell me anything i mean there is no healthy relationship right you can't have a healthy relationship with those people a few days ago i was talking in plug in i was talking about the four negative things that will destroy healthy relationships um from uh, philippians chapter 2 i think chapter 2 uh, i was talking about um how paul lists down four things four negative things that will destroy a relationship one of them is self importance when you begin to think that you are the guy you start destroying relationship there is no there is no depth in those kind of relationships it's hollow it's shallow at best it's just knee deep that's it that's the problem with fools they don't have good healthy deep relationships with anybody nobody wants to stay with a fool in fact no relationship is is longer than few months maybe at best a year with a fool if you are struggling with lack of relationships and friendships maybe it's a good day to do an introspection of yourself that's number one there's a second way the foolish talk it's i've been there done that been there done that have you ever had friends like that that you are so excited about the new achievement that you have done for the, imagine the first time you played cricket and you really played well on that day and then you kind of hit a six and maybe a 50 and things like that and you want to talk to your friend and tell your friend uh, well if he's your friend uh, and tell him that you know this is what i have achieved today and then he would say that's nothing i've already done that man it's like just taking the water and pouring on your head right i was so excited about this you have people like that in our lives who's always who's always constantly putting down your enthusiasm by saying things like we already i already know that i already done that before been there done that you see the problem with them is that they don't make any effort to understand your excitement they don't make any effort to understand you proverbs chapter 18 verses 2 puts it beautifully to us a uh, fools have no interest in understanding fools have no interest in understanding in fact they only want to air their own opinions that's all they want it's it's like this they never let you finish your story uh, um, neither make an effort to understand worse the worst case scenario is this that they are more focused on finishing your story and then adding their story to it hey if you find yourself among them or if you are like that maybe today is a good day to correct yourself you see i read this beautiful statement that says this you cannot learn when your mouth is working you just cannot learn when your mouth is working 
you learn when your ears are working and your mouth is shut. It's true. Been there, done that. There's a third kind of foolish talk. This is the worst part of it. It's, it's, let me call this the one-upper. The one-upper. That no matter what you tell them, no matter how excited you are, no matter what you, you know, you, it could be possible that you really did a great job at, a, at, a, at work, did a great job in finishing your project that was given to you, and you come to them and you, you know, you kind of brag about it. Obviously, you're going to brag about it. You did a great job. So you're going to tell them, hey, you know, I, I did this. They will always come up with a story that is better than yours. It's like this, I, you know, you go to a fool and you say, I, I, today I climbed Mount Everest. It's been a lifelong dream for me, I climbed the Mount Everest. That's nothing, I climbed the Mount Everest without oxygen. <laughs> That's our fool talks. It's always one up. One up. I mean, there is no winning with them. There is never a chance of winning your argument over them. You're kind of like, shut, shut up already, man. That's how fools talk. Bible describes them all through. In fact, the wise man describes them all through verses chapter 12, verses 15. He says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. And then he contrasts that with another thing. He talks, while he talks about how foolish talk, he then describes, the wise man describes about a heart, a listening heart. How does a listening heart look like? And he describes it. I mean, he, he, he did a lot of, I mean, a um, lot of description of, of, of the listening heart. But let me just put it in three words. Number one, he says, a listening heart is a humble heart. A listening heart is a heart that knows I need to learn more. That's a listening heart. I guess God is looking for people who are humble. When he says, I'm looking for people who are humble, he's actually saying, well, I want people to listen to me. Proverbs chapter 1 verses 5, that's how he starts off the wise man. He says, let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. The more you receive wisdom, the more understanding you'll have, the more understanding you have, the more guidance you have for life. Chapter 11 of Proverbs verses 2 says this, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility, comes wisdom. So, um, you, know, you know, for us, obviously, the opposite of humility is pride, but, but I would say, for a learner, the opposite of humility is an attitude that says, I don't want to learn, I already know everything. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7, the wise man says this, don't think you are smart. I mean, that's exactly what the Bible says, by the way. Don't think you are smart. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Did you see what he's saying? He's saying, if you think you're smart, you got a problem. The problem is pride and God calls it sin. He hates it. In fact, in verses 8, he describes the problem with that kind of attitude. By the way, fools suffer with this. I'm sure you are wise people, you don't suffer with this. But this is what happens to fool. He says this, if you don't do that, your body will find diseases, it's a, you know, find itself with sicknesses. Your bones will start breaking. Some of us actually have a physical problem in our bodies because of a problem with attitude. I would say 90% of us. Not some, but 90%. Very few of us are Job's, by the way. If you don't know who is Job, Okay, thank God you know who's Job, right? Thank God. Don't look for Job around here. Right? Very few of us are Job's actually. Most of us suffer physically because we have a problem with our attitude. But a wise person knows that there is a lot to learn. He knows that he has to kill his pride. Even if he knows acquired more knowledge than others, he would never be in a position where he says, I know it all. I was listening to TED Talks a few days ago um, about life of a learner. Um, of course, I was preparing for this message, so I was listening to that. And um, there's a talk about this, this Hungarian 
three Hungarian um, people who did a great difference with their lives. And, uh, and he, 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 uh, the, the speaker narrates the stories of all those three. Um, I think one is a scientist, another is a professor and a textile business magnet, I guess. Um, I, he narrates their stories. Go back and listen. It's a 19 minutes talk. Just by the time you go home, you'll finish it. Um, just the story, the sheer um, you know, magnitude of their, their, their discipline, their, 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 you know, their work, um, their heart in, you know, in what they did. Uh, at the end, he finishes off with this by saying this, I've learned this, that all three of them have achieved what they've achieved because they never stopped learning. Never stopped learning. There's this constant, insatiable hunger in there that I've got to learn more. I've got to learn more. I'll come to that in a, in, a, in a bit. The key to developing a learning attitude is to kill your pride. Well, that's the most difficult part of it. The most difficult part, it is the most difficult part of it because we don't really agree that we are prideful. We don't want anybody to tell us that we are prideful. We would rather rationalize it or minimize it or deny it than agree that we got a problem. So it takes an honest, real look at ourselves and come to terms with our attitude before we begin to deal with that. So today, uh, let me ask that question. Check your heart. How, how teachable it is. You see, the, the point is this. If you are teachable in Jesus' words, you will inherit the whole earth. Blessed are those who are meek. In other words, he's saying, blessed are those who are teachable. For they shall inherit the whole earth. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. The world belongs to you if you are a learner. That's what Jesus is saying. Except for learning, we will try to win the whole world, you know. And Jesus saying, that's not the, that's not the, the point is this, that you, are, you stay humble, you learn, the more you learn, the better you become, and the world belongs to you. So, uh, a learning heart is humble. Number two, a learning has, heart has a desire to grow. That it constantly makes an effort to grow. It never stops learning from... It's, here is the point. It, there is no person who is so low that you don't learn from you can't learn from. A wise man always looks for opportunities to learn from people, learn from circumstances, learn from everything. They are never stop, they're never stopping seeking wisdom from things around them. I've, I've seen this, that all great leaders are insatiable learners. They have this deep desire that they want to grow they don't want to stay at the same place. They want to grow constantly. And they will learn from anybody, good people, bad people, the worst, ugly, everybody. They learn from everybody. Three years ago, I was on a sabbatical from our church, on a two-month sabbatical. I, um, you know, once in, uh, often I take that break so that I can learn from others. And so, I think it was 2016, early part of 2016, that I went to U.S. to, to, to connect with two pastors that... Um, uh, that that are great authors that I, I know, kind of follow them, Max Lucado and Mark Watterson. So I made appointments with them prior going there so that I can go and you know, just ask them a few questions that I can learn from them. By the way, we have one of those speakers that I, was, um, that I, you know, that I met in 2016 called Pastor Choko Isusdi. Um, Choko, is, 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 he's been here last year with us, just do an evening service with us with volunteers. He's going to be here doing a leadership conference in the next month. June 14th and 15th. So we have very limited seats because a lot of other pastors are going to join on that day and we're doing it in elementary. So you got to um, register. Whoever registers first would be the guys who are going to be invited into this. So, um, Pastor Janet would give you more details on that later. Uh, but here's um, I, one of those guys was Mark Batterson. Mark Batterson wrote some brilliant books. Um, he's a pioneer. Uh, like me, he went to a new place and started off with 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 little people, a small small number of people, and then began to grow. And within years, one of it's it's become one of the biggest churches in Washington D.C. area. Um, in fact, he bought out uh, an old used theater uh, and turned it into a church. In fact, the church is called the Theater Church. 
um, all around the Washington. Um, it, it, it's basically the name is National Community Church, but it's known in entire Washington D.C. as the Theater Church, just beside uh, the you know the railway station of Washington D.C. And so I, I really, I think five months prior to going to him, I made the appointment and I went there um, to Chicago only to find myself um, that a blizzard hit Washington. Now you know Washington area, if it, if it is hit by blizzard, no going into that city. It, it's just not going to happen. But the day I was going to leave, uh, my flight from Chicago was the last flight that took off. Uh, to, to Washington area. So somehow I managed to ma meet, you know, go to Washington and, and meet him on the day of the appointment and, and had like three hours of conversation. Now I want you to know this, that while, while reaching to his church, I started writing down all the things that I want to ask him about leadership, about how do I help people to become better in our church? Uh, what can I do to help people to become great leaders? You know, things like that. Um, and, um, and I had this list of questions that I'm going to ask him and get, the, get as much as I can from him. And I walked into his office. It's a small office, it's almost like a matchbox. It's, it's probably about 10 by 10, this, this, this big, that's it. It's a small room. Walked into that room only to find uh, that this guy had just two chairs surrounded by books. I mean, it's just books. Huh? I walked in and all I could see is just books. I mean, from down all the way up, there's no ceiling. I can't see a ceiling there. Just books. Take them. Here is the interesting part. His coffee table was books. All of them were books, right in front. So we, I was sitting on the other side. He said, hey, there's no coffee table. Just get, grab your coffee, and you can put it on, the, on, on these books. So those are the books that he's reading at the present, right? So it's a, a coffee table. And I started... I took out my notepad and I, I, I'm going to ask this question. And just as I opened my mouth, he said, hey, thanks for coming. I said, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I said, I have a question to you. This is what he's asking me, okay? I have a question, okay? Shoot off. And then he began to ask one question, and then another question, and then another question. Without, I, I think we drank like five coffees. Two and a half hours later, I found myself talking and him sitting there and listening all the while asking me the questions. When I am the guy who's supposed to interview him. Two and a half hours later, I was exhausted. I can't ask him any more questions. I just shared my story, talked about Capstone, talked about what do we do in this church and how do, uh, what kind of people come to our church, you know, all that stuff and how, uh, and how we are growing and all that. At the, end of this, at the end of two hours, two and a half hours, he said, thank you very much for joining us, uh, joining me and, and thank you for teaching me. Really, he gave a book called Chase the Lion to me, signed and gave to me, and he said, thank you for teaching me whatever you taught me today. Why don't you write a book? That's all he said. And then I walked away from there, completely dazed, sat in the train on the way to Baltimore, but, because I was flying out of Baltimore. I was, I was sitting in the train, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, what, what happened? And that's when it dawned on to me that in the process of talking to me, while making me talk, he taught me the most important lesson of a leader. Listen. The more you listen, the better you become. That's probably why he is what he is. He's, he's probably going to be the, the, the you know, world AG superintendent a few years from now. He's one of those guys. Brilliant. A listening heart is always open and willing to learn and adapt from everything around it. A desire to grow. Number three, um, a listening heart will embrace correction. That's the beauty of a listening heart. He constantly goes back to this idea of being corrected. Wise man. Constantly says, son, my son, do not refuse rebuke. Do not, do not get bitter if you are corrected. Don't do that. It's, a fool, fool, it's, it's fools who refuse correction. It's fools who rebuke a disciplinary action on them. They don't want discipline. In fact, Proverbs chapter 12 verses 1 says this, to learn 
you must love discipline i love it i love the way it is expressed to us to learn you must learn you must love discipline that means you must be willing to be corrected that means it, you must be willing sometimes if god takes a rod and and spanks you you must be willing to be spanked because you know that is a sign of love only a guy who is willing to be disciplined will be a good learner will grow you see accepting correction is the sign of humility and teachability so he says this uh, to learn you must love discipline i love the next way next next statement he says it is stupid to hate correction i mean i love when bible uses the word stupid it sounds so nice <laughs> stupid it is stupid it's almost like a father who's exasperated with his son saying are you stupid fellow listen to me it's almost in that right in that sense it'll be foolish it'll be stupid if you reject correction but wise embrace correction they make changes i'll come to that towards the end so then uh, he describes how a foolish life looks like then he describes how a uh, uh, listening heart looks like and finally uh, he talks about how a teachable life looks like all through um, the proverbs um i some of these thoughts may overlap for you but let me just list them out for you so that you know you are happy that you took took your notes uh, uh proverbs chapter 13 verses 13 and 14 uh, would would probably be the you know base for how a teachable looks like life looks like people who despise advice are asking for trouble those who respect a command will succeed the instruction of wise is like a life giving fountain and those who accept it avoid the snares of death in that one single statement well two statements that in 14 um he points the he pointed out few things to me the wise man not, not all through the scripture all through proverbs of course he comes back to this this idea that here is how a teachable looks like, life looks like a learner always initiates learners initiate you see i understand that when we are growing up as a child we don't have a choice but to go to school so it's it's like thirst upon us teachers are thirst upon us knowledge is thirst upon us but you begin to grow and and your life starts getting transformed when you begin to enjoy learning from others when you are the guy who is taking the first step to learn from others learners initiate they don't wait for somebody to come to them and teach them they are the ones who are going in search of wisdom in search of knowledge understanding james chapter 1 verses 5 i like the way he describes wisdom right i mean um, uh, the need for wisdom he says this if you need wisdom ask our generous god when a second let's just rewind that if you need wisdom ask our generous god now why did he say ask god i mean god already knows i'm fool right god already knows i need wisdom why can't he just simply give the wisdom to me but james says in order to receive wisdom from god the first step has to come from you you so here is the problem with um, with receiving free wisdom for free Oh, you know that you already started smiling when you receive wisdom for free you don't make use of it in fact you may be in a position to reject it that's probably why god also refrains from giving wisdom to you ask me and then i'll give you how much i'll give i'll give you abundantly but first you got to ask me it's your step first a teachable life begins with in you know this this heart of it initiative it, it learning is your prerogative remember that i remember a story um 
of how a young man uh, walked up to Socrates long ago and asked him, hey, you know, I traveled 1,500 miles all the way from my hometown to, 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 to you, uh, to gain wisdom from you. I, I'd, like to, I'd like for you to teach me wisdom and knowledge and, uh, you know, you know make, me, make me a wise person like you. And Socrates said, well, okay, I'll show you. Let's, let's just get out of this place. So from, from, from the place that they were in, he, he, le he led him, um, this, this guy who came to visit him, uh, all the way out of, this, uh, out of the town and led him to a pond that was nearby um, the city gates and asked him to walk along with him. So they both walked into the water, almost waist deep. And then once they were there, um, probably, you know, the, the water filled up to their chest. And then that's when Socrates says, um, he, the story goes that Socrates put his hand over his head. So the guy was really excited and he thought it must be some initiation process of receiving wisdom and stuff like that. And just as he was relaxing, he would just push him down into the water. And then kept him there. This guy struggled for air, struggled for life. And, and finally, at a point where he said, uh, you know, all the resistance stopped and he just gave up, that's when he released him. And so the guy gets up from, the, from, this, from this water, breathless, almost dazed, uh, losing his conscience. He walks back uh, to, the, to the shore and falls down. And Socrates just looks at him and walks away from there, goes back to his office. Sometime gaining the, uh, you know, some kind of strength and some kind of consciousness got up and wondering why did Socrates did this, walked up to him and uh, reached to his office and said, why would you do that? Why would you push me into the water? And then Socrates looked at him and asked him, when you were underwater, what was the one thing that you really wanted? And he said, of course, air. Right? So Socrates told him, when you want wisdom like that, wisdom will find you. I mean, God may not push you into the water, but if you ask, he will definitely give. In the situation that you are in, wherever you are in. Wisdom, um, a, a teachable life begins with initiative. Learners initiate. Number two, learners implement. Learners implement. You saw a four-minute video on a word called Shama this morning. It wouldn't have made sense to you, right? I wanted it to be like that so that you will actually begin to pay attention to what you're actually receiving from the church. That word Shama used all through the scripture. And the one thing that the video was trying to make clear to us is this. That while the word means hear, it also means obey. There is no word for obedience in the Bible. It's Shama. In Hebrew literature, both hearing and obeying are conveyed by one single word, Shama. That is how a teachable life is. Not only they are willing to listen, they are actually implementing it, obeying it, following it in their lives. There I've, 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 I'm, I'm, I know I'm making a generalized statement at this point of time, but I actually think that the world needs a church that not only listens, but actually implements what it listens. The world is, uh, the, the church is growing across the world, but it should, it is not growing at the pace it is supposed to grow. It should have grown because I think for the most part of us, for, for the most part, many of us as Christians, we are more satisfied with receiving, with receiving and never implementing it in our lives. Somehow, by the time you walk out of this place, you kind of sense, okay, there are things that I don't want, I don't like, uh, I didn't understand, this I like, but let me just try it out. You may not exactly think like that, but that's exactly what you do. What we do, sorry. And I have a feeling because of that mindset of Christendom across the world, we are not making the kind of impact we are supposed to make. I mean, look at the, look at the way church grew in the first 100 years and the next 1900 years. If you, even if you do a comparison of both those, that 100 years and this 1900 years, 
that first hundred years would be like, like way ahead of us in the way it grew, in the passion that people had, in the way people believed that Jesus is going to come back, so I'm going to make sure I live my life in such a way that I would show people what I believe is true. Maybe it's time, leaders, influencers, that you not only receive information, that you would start implementing them. That's probably what James meant in, in verses 22, chapter 1, verses 22, when he said, be the doers of the word, not just the hearers only. Because if you're thinking that by, the, by, the, by hearing itself I'm done, you're deceiving yourself. Don't deceive yourself. That's what he's saying, right? Don't deceive yourself by just hearing. Be the doer of what you hear. I read an article on, on learning process and um, the article talks about how there are three stages in which usually the learning takes place. It's not on your notes. You want to write down this. The first stage is when you're beginning, when you're beginning to learn right answers. That's the first stage of learning. All our school-going children, they're learning right answers even before they ask the questions. Right? So they're learning. We're learning right answers. In the second stage, we learn to ask right questions. That's the second stage. Where we come, in a, this is our learning process. Where you begin to ask the right questions. But they say learning process is at its peak. Especially in... in, in Influencing leaders is this, that they reach to stage three. Stage three is to know when to ask the right question. That's a stage three. Yes, there are a lot of right questions to ask, but you should know what to ask and when to ask that. So I know that a person is implementing what he's learning when he begins to ask specific questions about life. Number three, learners improve. That's the third thing. Learners improve. That they're constantly growing. I talked about that um, before too, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell much on that. But I just want to remind you of a, of a myth that I talked about to you uh, two years ago, how um, our, the growth in our lives gets stunted because of a myth. It's called the knowledge myth. The knowledge myth is this, that since I know better, I can do better. That's the knowledge myth. I talked about this on the 2017 31st night, right? And I, I said, many of us suffer with this disease, well, this myth, thinking that since I already know, I can do better. The problem is just because you know doesn't mean you're becoming better. Ask any parent with a child who's growing, especially a teenage child. Every morning you get up and you tell your child, fold your blanket. And they would say, okay. Day two, fold your blanket, okay. Day three, fold your blanket, okay. Day four, fold your blanket, I know. Day five, hey, I know, you don't tell me, I know and they still don't fold their blanket. <laughs> Just because I know doesn't mean I'm becoming better. You get the picture? So you need to improve. Improvement is shown when you consciously begin to make changes in your life. And it shows in your life. Knowing alone does not enable me to stop making mistakes, but making a conscious choice to make changes in life help me to make better, do better things next time, become better next time. Number four, um, number four, learners inspire. Learners inspire. This is one thing about learners, just as I, I, I talked about Mark Batterson and how his, his life still inspires me. Not just Mark Madison, you know, any, the speaker who's going to come on June 14th and 15th, his life inspires me. The way he built a church, uh, the way he serves his community is one of the, uh, one of the greatest inspi inspirations to me that one day I want to be that, um, there that, you know, that we as a church would be a church that is actually making Hyderabad better. That's what we, uh, we want to be. Uh, that's where I want to be. 
one day. It's, it's not about how, how many people coming to our church, it's about how much influence are we exerting on this city. I think that's what measures us as a church, you know. Uh, that's where I want to go to. I've learned this from him. Learners inspire us. Their stories, their lives, what they do inspire us all the time. You see, this is what James says, James chapter 3 verse 18. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and then they will reap, reap the harvest of righteousness. Learners' life is like that, a bit like that. They sow wisdom, they learn wisdom, they sow wisdom into others and then it becomes a harvest. That hundreds and thousands of us would look back and find inspiration from people like this. One classic example from the Bible is Josiah. Four chapters are dedicated to him in two books, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. 2 Kings chapter 22 and chapter 23, go back and read it. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and 30, 33 and 34. Sorry, 34 and 35. Just four chapters. One, one statement just caught my attention. And it's a statement that, 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 that talks about Josiah. There has never been a king like Josiah before and after. I mean, you know, this is the word of God, right? That means this is actually coming from the mouth of God. Talking about a king who became a king at eight years old, when he was eight years old. He died when he was 36 years old. I mean, hardly lived like that, you know. Very short life. But Bible gives a testimony. That means God is giving a testimony about this guy, saying that there has never been a guy like this. And I saw, I was really interested in his life, and I started researching through all those four chapters and began to look at what made him the, you know, the guy he's become. One thing stands out in his life. Josiah is an insatiable learner. Insatiable, I mean, this guy, when he was 16 years old, eight years, he became a king. And so that means there is somebody else who's actually running the country. He's just a namesake king. But when he's 16 years old, he now has the power to start making decisions. The first decision that he made when he was 16 years old, Bible says, he began to seek for the God of his ancestor, David. Wow, I loved it. He's not looking for doctorates and degrees. He's actually looking for God. I mean, I'm not saying don't, don't study. I know it's you guys are here. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, the point is this. That the first thing that he decided with the freedom that he's got is to find his God. He sought after his God and because he looked for his God, God began to reveal himself to him. And he corrected himself, he corrected the country around him, uh, and he began to clean the temple. And Bible says, as he began to clean the temple, he found the word of God. When he received the word of God, he didn't just you know, clean it up and a nice looking Bible and put it in the showcase. He said, I want to read it. I want to know what it says. And as he began to read it, it started changing his life. He wants to have more understanding, so he looked for more prophets, people who can explain that to him. And he found a prophetess called Halda and, and sent and asked for her and, and she explained what the scripture means to him. And the more he learned, the more he realized he needs to change, his country needs to change. So he makes a vow that I'm going to live according to the word of God and obey it as long as I live. And then he calls for the entire nation together into Jerusalem. And here is what he does. He makes everybody read the Bible. Everybody. And he explains the scriptures to them. Of course, through the scribes and lawmakers. And here is the beautiful thing. He made everybody make a commitment that they will obey the word of God. Just like how he did it. And the way his story ends, I love the way his story ends. It says this. That as long as Josiah lived, the people of Israel followed God. As long as Josiah lived, entire nation followed God, obeyed God. What an inspiration, huh? So as long as you live, hopefully your entire family follows you, follows God. I think that would be a great achievement for many of us. Let's start there. As long as you live, make that your goal, that as long as I live, I want my family to follow 
God. Learners inspire others. Just because Josiah chose to learn to follow, he became great. And that's where he left this little bit of wisdom for us. This is what it means. It is for today. The habit of a teachable spirit produces a life of consistent wisdom. The habit of a teachable spirit produces a life of consistent wisdom. You want consistent wisdom? Be teachable always. And you'll keep receiving bits and pieces of wisdom from all over to you. You see, if you want to be fruitful, you must become teachable. That's the point of today. If you want to be fruitful, you need to be teachable. Let's close our eyes. It's a very simple lesson, right? Something that we already know, but yet something that we need to be reminded of constantly. And I'm glad today you chose, you were willing to receive it. If you are willing to receive the wisdom that God constantly is pouring into your life, be grateful for it. Make a commitment to, you know, to accept discipline in your life. That when God corrects you, accept it, make corrections. Develop, um, develop a healthy habit of learning constantly. That's how a teachable life looks like.